Conversation with the Candidate continues. Thank you for clicking on our extended digital conversation with the candidate with Congressman Tim Ryan of Ohio. The next 30 minutes is commercial free so we can get to as many questions as possible. And we're going to start with Carolyn Moore. Thank you. Uh, Hillary Clinton, former nominee of the Democratic Party after her loss, hit the nail on the head by saying, I did not realize this country was so divided. How do you plan on getting us united again? I think it starts with respect. I think we've got to start respecting each other, even if we disagree. And we, we've got to care for each other. I mean, not to, to get sentimental about it, but we've got to care about each other. We're all in the same boat. We're all blessed to be Americans. And we've got to start from that point that we're human beings and we've got to respect each other. We don't always have to like each other. This is like what we tell our teenage kids, you know? Like, you've got to love each other, but we know you're not always going to like each other, but it doesn't matter. Um, that's the philosophy I'm going to bring. I'm going to listen. We, I think we have to listen. And I, I think Republicans have some good ideas. I think we need the free market to help move the needle and really scale things up. That, so let's sit down and work it out. I'm not here to be on an ego trip. I'm here to get the job done for our kids. And I think when you approach it with an open heart, an open mind, and a good deal of respect, then I think it can unlock some of the toxicity that we're dealing with today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Carolyn. Next question comes from Dan Bergeron. Welcome back. It's great Thank you. to see you back in New Hampshire. Thank you. Another important question. What does education funding mm -hmm. look like in Orion White House and locally here in Manchester and the rest of New Hampshire? Well, as you know, most of it is, is uh, state funded, but I do believe that the federal government has more and more of an important role moving forward. We have got to get, we have got to get the numbers up when it comes to uh, funding uh, students with disabilities. There's a 40% commitment by the federal government that we haven't got anywhere close to funding. Um, I believe, in, under my administration, we are going to focus on social and emotional learning. Our kids are coming to school with a tremendous amount of, of trauma. Kids in the United States, over 50% of them show up that, that show up at our public schools uh, and attend our public schools live in poverty, li are low-income kids and they come with all of the issues that come with living in a low-income fashion. Social and emotional learning has been by connecting kids. So you connect kids to their teacher, to their students, to the school, to the broader community. You teach them how to handle their emotions. You teach them how to deal in social situations like bullying and the pressure you get around you know, uh, teenage drug use and teen sex. You teach them real techniques on how to deal with these things and then to de-escalate themselves and to handle the, the, the emotional pressures that come with being a kid. Now, why? And does this work? This has been shown in a, over 300,000 kids who have a robust social and emotional learning program. 11 percentile point increase in test scores. 10 percent increase in good behavior. 10% decrease in antisocial behavior, a 20% swing in the climate of the schools, and it closes the achievement gap. Because in my administration, we're gonna take science and experience, and we're gonna translate it into policies that actually matter. And we will begin to close the achievement gap with, with social and emotional learning. And the third piece is gonna be vocational education. I think the federal government has a responsibility. One of the worst things we ever did was get rid of shop class. And now we've got people who need to move into the economy and have some of these skills, and these jobs are going unfilled. So we're going to focus on that as well, and we're going to pay for it. Thank you. I was looking for optimal numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, thanks so much for your question. And uh, following up on that, when we talk with educators and candidates and they interface there in a school, the educators will say time and again, testing is taking the joy out of teaching. Oh. What's the balance between figuring out what kids are learning through testing yeah. and not making sure that you're squeezing out the rest of it? Yeah, I, th I think part of what we have to do is realize what others are doing so that, so that the Department of Education is sharing information to where you can go from your, your school district and plug in what the metrics are, what's the poverty rate, how many kids, you know, what's the free and reduced lunch rate, and all of this, and figure out what other communities, what other school districts are doing so that you can begin to say, okay, what is that balance between 
assessing a kid's ability and over testing, which is happening uh, uh, today. Learning has to be fun. And we've got to take care of the kids, but learning has to be fun because we want our kids to be lifelong learners. I think that's going to be critically important moving forward, and that means paying teachers. I think the social and emotional learning piece is key because there's a lot of fear in education today for a lot of kids who are dealing with a lot of, uh, a lot of trauma. And we've got to move back, take a step back from the testing. And I want people to start seeing social and emotional learning as a way through social and emotional learning to increase test scores without having the huge pressure around testing. Okay. Next up is a social media question coming from Adrian Dassing. He asks, is an individual bound by law to pay federal income tax? <laughs> yes. <laughs> as much as we all dislike it, yes. This has been a conservative talking point that's been big here in New Hampshire lately. Taxation is theft. What do you think about that? Taxation is the price we all have to pay for living in a civilized society where you have water and sewer and airports and education and uh, investments into education and Social Security and Medicare. Well, while we all have issues with this, and I think we need a huge government reform proposal, I don't think the government is running as efficiently as we need it to. I think Democrats need to take the lead on that. Uh, we all want to live in a civilized society, and that entails us making that contribution. Okay, next question is coming from Terrence Ganarian. Hi. Um, so as an immigrant and a, who's now a proud uh, U.S. citizen, right. I, I know what it is to be part of the American dream. Uh, my question is, what are your plans for immigration, specifically those individuals who are undocumented? I, there's two parts to the immigration, as we talked uh, a little bit earlier, uh, about making sure the border is secure, making sure drugs don't get in, making sure terrorists get in, and then having a compassionate e uh, immigration system that that allows people to come into the country, especially caring for uh, refugees and people who are in trouble. And then I believe we need to f find a pathway to citizenship for people who are here, uh, who, are, who are working hard, who are playing by the rules. And we can figure out how to do it with paying back taxes or uh, paying a fine or whatever. But I think the country is going to be better off if we find a pathway. Um, my great-grandparents were Italian immigrants, and I remember to going to you know, Christmas Eve and the family parties and, and my great-aunts talking in broken English. I was born into an uh, immigrant family, and we appreciated that. We've got to get away from that. We've got to start seeing America's diversity as our greatest strength, and that means a compassionate way to get undocumented people out of the shadows and into our society where they can thrive and contribute in a, a variety of different ways that this country has always seen and highlighted and supported. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Terrence. And to follow up on that, Congressman, what does a, a compromise immigration bill come uh, out of the Ryan White House looking like? Well, I think it'll look a lot like the, the Gang of Seven bill that Marco Rubio and John McCain put together that I think got about 70 votes in the Senate. Uh, a few years back that they all kind of abandoned when, when President Trump came in and started throwing gasoline all over the place when it came around or, uh, issues ar around immigration. So that kind of bill where you, again, border security, make sure we're all firm, but then a compassionate pathway to citizenship in seven years, uh, paying a fine, paying back taxes, the depending on the circumstances, but making sure that there is a pathway there, including the DACA kids, making sure there's a fix for, for uh, the, the kids who had, we had deferred action on, that we bring them in the full citizenship as well. And what we've seen, and the projections are, 1.2 or 3 percent growth to the, to the GDP. Now everybody who comes in is paying taxes and contributing to the economy and paying into Social Security and paying into Medicare and that's going to bolster our economy. Next question comes from Olivia Zink. Hi, thanks Hi. for being with us. Thank you. And thank you so much for your support and sponsorship of HR1, the biggest democracy reform this country has seen, the For the People Act. I am really deeply concerned about how our elections are funded. Um, you spoke earlier about public funding of elections, but if elected, would you fix our democracy first? 
it's it's essential. I mean, I think that the, the democratic uh, way is getting distorted because of the money in politics. So the top 1% own 90% of the wealth. And when you look at who got the tax cut in the last round of, of, uh, of the Trump's tax cut, a lot of those people are huge donors uh, to the Republican Party. So they get hundreds of million dollars back in taxes and then they dump them into these super PACs that end up spending money to get people elected who will continue down the road of, of keeping those those tax cuts. So fixing the democracy has to be essential. I think it's the democracy and the economy. Those are the two things we really got to move on. So it, it will be a priority for me. I believe in publicly financing of elections. I've been supportive of that my entire career, not just because I hate raising money as an elected official, but I think it is the most corrosive thing happening in our democracy today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. And just to follow on that question, Congressman, uh, all sorts of candidates are making pledges about the kind of donations and money they won't take mm -hmm. in this race. So as a candidate, can you lay out what kind of money you're not going to be taking? In you know, I, have, I haven't made any pledges yet. I mean, I, I've never felt like if I take a contribution from somebody that somehow I'm obligated to vote for them. Um, I've accepted donations from a variety of people and voted against their interests. They're not always happy with that. But my own personal opinion is if, if you're accepting money and then you feel obligated to have to vote that way, you're in the wrong business. You're not representing your people. So I, at this point, I've not made any uh, pledges or anything uh, with regard to campaign finance other than to say, I think I'm the only candidate talking about publicly financing of elections. And that to me is the, the main commitment, the main push we need to have. And do you have a position on term limits? for members of Congress? Congress yeah, I say Congress and the Senate. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not a term limit fan. I never have been because in my experience, what you'll have is you'll have bureaucrats, whether they're in the Department of Defense, Department of Education, Army Corps of Engineer, wherever, that have 40 years experience. And then you have a member of Congress who's trying to get something done or a senator that's trying to get something done who does not have the level of experience as the bureaucrat you're trying to move with policy, and they outfox you. And I knew this. I mean, when I first got in, these people I was dealing with, they knew a hell of a lot more than I did. Now I've been in 17 years. Now I know at least as much as they do, and I have the authority to try to move them along. So I think it, you'll have staff and bureaucrats running the entire federal government. And I think that's a, that's a bad deal for us. And I've seen members of Congress who had been in 30 or 40 years call bureaucrats out and say, that's baloney because I've been here longer than you and you're going to do what we got elected to do by the people. I think it's, it's, it's giving away the store. It's giving away the power that sh should belong to the people through their elected representatives. Okay. Next question comes from Margaret Anderson. Hi. Thank you for coming. Are you in favor of ranked choice voting? <coughs> um, say it again. Are you in favor of ranked choice voting? Ranked choice. I don't know. I don't know. I, someone asked me this last night, and I have not looked at it, so I can't, I can't give you a, a good answer. It sounds really interesting to me. Um, I know they do it in Maine, and I was watching Jared Golden's race up there, and someone was kind of saying, oh, it's, it's a ranked choice. And I was like, what? <laughs> so give me some time to study up on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Social media question next from Nils Christensen. He asks, what will you do to stop the wasting of taxpayer money? This has got to be a major uh, initiative for Democrats. We don't talk enough about waste in the government. If you look at the Medicare uh, program, for example, there is $50 billion a year wasted in the Medicare program. That's a billion dollars a week. Now, we want Medicare. I'm not going to, so we need to put um, structures in place in our health care programs, in our uh, military uh, programs, and in the Defense Department, and agriculture, and all of these 
to squeeze and get these programs running efficiently. We need a strong reinventing of government using data analytics, using metrics. There's no reason why we should be wasting this money. And I'm not saying we save that money in the Medicare program and we give it to Warren Buffett in a tax cut. I'm saying we save that money and reinvest it back into the program and extend the life of the program. But it is ridiculous for us to cede that territory to conservatives because all they do is they make it look like the government isn't working efficiently and then they cut the programs and they cut the funding. So we need to be, as defenders of health care for everybody, as defenders of uh, education, making sure these programs are running really efficiently. So we will have a big reinventing government initiative uh, that, that we will be proposing. And I'm, I'm excited about it because I think it's 2019. Right? Trump wants to build the wall. We're talking about technology. Let's use that technology to really get the government working efficiently for the American people. Two things you just touched on there. Health care. Are you in support of Medicare for all? I've been on the Medicare for All bill since 2007. So I tell all the new people who are in Congress now, I said, I'm on Medicare for All before it was even cool, okay? Um, I think the natural next step is bring Medicare down to 50 or 55. If you want to stay on your private insurance, you can. Help people pay for it like the Affordable Care Act did where you would give people credits if they couldn't quite afford for the health care uh, piece, the Medicare piece. I would allow businesses with under 50 employees to be able to buy into the Medicare program. This will help with innovation, this will help with entrepreneurship, this will help with small businesses because they're getting killed today with health care costs. But I actually think this is not necessarily the, the right conversation. We can't just be talking about a health care system that covers us when, our, when we're sick. We've got to talk about a health care system that actually keeps us healthy. And how do we build incentives into the process for employers, for patients, and for doctors that get rewarded for keeping us healthy? 75% of our health care costs today are for chronic diseases that could be prevented, which means we've got to look at our food system. We've got to look at the stress in our, in our country uh, that we have, economic, uh, and otherwise. We've got to look at our agriculture system uh, as well. So how do we have a system that isn't what we have today, which is disease management, right? And then you've got the healthcare companies and the pharmaceutical companies saying, how can I make money off of this thing, right? If we want to knock the, the socks off of or kneecap the pharmaceutical industry, let's figure out how to stay healthy. We spend two and a half times as much as every other industri industrialized country, we get worse results. That's a broken system. So part of it is us being competitive and healthy and ready to rock and roll against China. And to me, that means a system that moves towards prevention, factors in food as a component to the diseases, and then we need to set metrics over the next decade of how do we cut cardiovascular disease in half? How do we cut diabetes in half? And diabetes, just lastly, half the country today has either diabetes or prediabetes. A diabetic costs 2.3 times as much as every other patient. That is going to sink the healthcare system. So whether it's Medicare for all, private insurance, fee for service, out of pocket, VA, however you want to say it, that system's going to sink if, if half the country has diabetes. And so my pitch is going to be front-loading it, talking about food, talking about prevention, talking about what we're giving our kids in our schools, getting us healthy again, and being less reliant on pharmaceutical companies. That's what we can do as an act of rebellion against the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, we'll get to Gail in a second here, but you mentioned agricultural policy. It's too bad the Colby Sawyer student uh, isn't here today because she's asked this question repeatedly about how do you get more local food to people? Well, you have a policy uh, in the Ag Department, and then circling back to the waste, too. A lot of people see waste in the Ag Department. But how do you first reform that department, and then you're talking about making people healthier through food policy? Explain. Yeah, so I wrote a book a few years ago called The Real Food Revolution, and in the subtitle, I talk about the return of the family farm. We've got to have agricultural policies that move to regional, regional and sustainable farming because it's better for the environment. It produces real food, 
not the highly you know, crops that go into really highly processed foods. I think we need to reward and pay farmers for growing real food, growing more produce. Pay them for the transition out of where they are, and then we're going to save the money in healthcare costs in the long run. We need to build out a strong urban agricultural agenda where we're actually closing down the gap where they call food deserts, where there's not a grocery store within a mile or two of where many people live. Same issue in, in rural communities. So build out this agricultural system to promote and pay farmers more to grow this healthy food and transition away from the traditional row crops. They're still going to do that. But it's better for the environment, too, because they don't use all the pesticides. You know, we have algae blooms in the Great Lakes. There's a dead zone at the mouth of the Mississippi River because of all the chemicals running down and going into the Gulf of Mexico. We're destroying our environment. And just say, lastly, what one of my, uh, I'm, I mentioned this in Iowa, um, we need to pay farmers to sequester carbon. Farmers can be a big part of the solution of reversing climate change because they can help with some regenerative agricultural techniques, no-till farming, cover crops, all of these methods can actually in the long run help us put more carbon into the soil and we should pay farmers to do that as well. So you can, this is what I'm saying, if we come together, sit down with farmers, sit down with public health people, sit down with the people in the food industry and say, how do we do this? It could be good for the environment, it could be good for our healthcare system. You got kids in our society that will be healthier and have better cognitive functions so our kids are in school and they're focused and concentrating which is what we need them to do win 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 and if Monsanto loses in the process hey so be it but most of us are gonna win by breaking down this current system okay next question comes from Gail Taylor Hi, Hi. Hi. Would you support Sorry you got stuck up there listening <laughs> hey, to me while you were standing. It's great. It's he got good. me all fired up, though. That was his fault. Good. good. Uh, would you support uh, overturning Citizens United? Oh, my God, yes. Can we do it right now? Yeah. Yeah. I just think yeah. the, the dark money has been, has been corrosive to the political environment. And we see it every day. And these ads show up. And you don't even know who donates to these big super PACs. And these people who just got the tax cut can dump it into the system and write five, ten million dollar checks. It's obnoxious. It needs to end. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Uh, circling back, you said something about climate change there. Uh, you talk about coming from this Rust Belt district, <coughs> and that's a tough issue, uh, at least as some people see it, talking about that in industrial areas. So when the conversation does turn to climate change in Youngstown, Ohio, how do you talk about it when you're home? Jobs. I, I believe that an aggressive agenda around climate means jobs and we've got to stop seeing it as a negative I'll give you two or three or ten examples depending on how much time you have but I'll give you I'll give you a couple of really good ones electric vehicles so right now there's one to two million electric vehicles in the world by 2030 there's going to be 30 million electric vehicles I want those made in the United States I want the batteries made in the United States. I want the platforms made in the United States. I want the steel made in the United States. You know, you get my point. Same with the batteries. Same with the charging stations. Uh, some estimates have it as a multi-trillion dollar opportunity for business just rebuilding the charging stations to charge these cars. Be huge benefit for the environment. So how does, what does that mean to someone who's struggling to make ends meet? It means a good job, and, and we should, again, sit down with the venture capitalists, sit down with the Department of Energy, sit down with the big three, sit down with the supply chain. Uh, and, and, the, and the President of the United States needs to convene and use the weight of the office not to bash former first ladies, but to convene and get the American economy going. You know who dominates the electric vehicle market now? China, 40% of it. We're at 20%. Do the same thing around solar. Right? These are all things we want to do for climate, but it's just a different way of saying to the average person who's struggling to make ends meet, has a health care issue, opiate crisis, climate is way over here, not because they don't care, but because the pressures of daily life don't allow them to entertain those, those bigger problems. Solar. Trying to control 60% of the solar uh, market. Those are jobs. And if we have tax policies and investments from the Department of Energy and other investments and incentives through the tax code, 
new market tax credits and all of, all of these things, drive that investment into the distressed communities from the old economy, right? So if you've lost jobs, if your wages are down, how do we get all of these investments sprinkled around the country? So invest into the smaller communities and then get this private sector, which is why I say we can't be hostile to the, to the, gover to the um, private sector because the federal government is not going to reverse climate change. Just like the federal government didn't go to the moon, it was the private sector, the technologies, the engineers who worked for the private sector, they got us to the moon. We set the policy, put some investment, put some skin in the game, catalyze, and then let's go. And I think it's a huge job opportunity, and that's how I talk about it at home. Okay, uh, social media question here coming from <coughs> Patrick O'Hare on an issue that is uh, really bubbled up here in the Democratic primary. Uh, does he support reparations, i.e. reparations for slavery? Yeah, I support the, uh, there's a bill to form a commission, uh, which I've always been supportive of and I will continue to support, which will uh, study the impact of, of, of slavery. I mean, clearly we can't account for the damage social, cultural, political, economic that has, has been done because of slavery and its aftermath. And so I think it's important for us to, to have that uh, knowledge, to have that information as a part of a conversation. But what the, the bigger question is, will we make investments into closing the opportunity gaps that exist in communities of color? Are we going to address the structural racism that is in our society today, in our criminal justice system, uh, in our education system? Yes, we have to. And this information can be very informative as we aggressively try to close those gaps down. Okay, we just have a few minutes left here. I'm curious, in a big picture question, what adversity have you faced in your life that has made you a better leader? Well. You know, growing up, uh, you know, in a community that had uh, economic issues, uh, my parents were divorced. I mean, that's always uh, semi-traumatic on a, on a young kid uh, for me and my brother and, and trying to overcome that. Um, but what I've learned is that your adversity uh, is a roadblock in, in some instances. But if there are people around you that help you as a kid, especially, you can overcome those adversities, those heartbreaks that you have. And I think it's important, and this is why it's a main theme in the campaign, is, is how do we come together? Um, because I know I, with all the challenges that come with that particular circumstance, um, the community was around me. It was my coaches, it was my teachers, it was the neighbor who would, kick you in the rear end if you needed it, and sometimes kick you in the rear end if you didn't need it, um, but was there for you, and they loved you, and they cared about you, and the, the idea that we're all, uh, we're all coming together. Another one was when I got hurt. I thought I was gonna be the quarterback of the Cleveland Browns when I was growing up, and that was like all my eggs were in one basket. And I blew my, I went, got a football scholarship to be a quarterback at Youngstown State University. And I was so excited. It was a Division I college, and I was going on to live my dream. First scrimmage, I blew my knee out and, you know, shattered, shattered the dreams. And now they had to get Baker Mayfield, and now he's the quarterback <laughs> there. So, I mean, I'm sorry, but I think they're going to be okay. Um, and that, that was really challenging, I mean, because that broke my identity, really, as, a, as a, this quarterback. Um, and I had, to, I had to overcome that and really reassemble, you know, who I was moving forward, but drew a lot from that. And that got me into politics, and here I am running for president. So God works in mysterious ways. And last question, we got about a minute here. You are unique in any candidate running for president in that you've lived in New Hampshire for an extended period of time. What was your favorite thing about living here when you went to UNH Law, then Franklin Pierce Law School? Oh, the fall. I mean, are you kidding me? You can't even explain it to people. We have uh, on our TV set at home, you know, when it goes quiet and they start flashing pictures, and one of the pictures, it's got to be from New Hampshire. I mean, the, the leaves are so vivid, and I would tell my wife, I'm like, that's, 
that's got to be New Hampshire. That, so the fall in New Hampshire, oh, nothing like it. So I'm going to be here a lot in the fall, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Congressman Tim Ryan, thank yeah. you so much for this Thanks. conversation with the candidate. We thank you, our audience of New Hampshire voters, and the folks watching at home. Again, next week, Congressman Eric Swalwell. Until we'll see you then. Uh, until then, have a great night.